markets. Uh, my main specialty, I received a degree in international trade and shipping business, logistics. Well, to most of you who are not involved uh, in this kind of business, uh, this sounds like hieroglyphs. Uh, but think about it. Everything you see around you in this room has been brought to you by either a ship or a train or a truck. Because the point of production is usually far away from the point of consumption. This is why we need transport. This is the bloodline of business, of production business. Uh, before we start uh, with the main things, uh, I'm just going to break down what makes the price of the product. Obviously, we have production costs, which are here, very basic things. Product related costs, what you need to make the product. Uh, admin, back office, OPEX. Uh, then come logistics costs. What do you need to do to transport this good from your production plant to the market? And of course, whatever, whatever's left is your profit, how much money you make. Well, production costs and other product related costs you pretty much can control. They are within your power, you can optimize them up to a certain level. However, logistic costs, unless you're a big company which owns their own fleet of trucks or their own fleet of ships, you cannot control. And this issue with logistics costs being third party, coming from third party providers and influencing your profit and as a result the final price on the good actually play a vital role in whether the trade between two countries, between two companies will exist or won't. So with the minimization of the logistics costs, one can increase the profit and become price competitive to the end buyer's growth. This is a very, very important issue that we want everybody to understand. Most of you probably already know that, but this is what actually makes a certain country competitive on the market today. So moving on, uh, this is just the importance of shipping industry, obviously there are different modes of transportation in the world. The most important one of this are ships, vessels. 90% of internationally traded goods move by ships, think about it. Alliance share. Shipping industry is the leading indicator of global GDP and international trade. Because if you look at the graph of the freight trades, so how much you pay per unit of cargo of ships, say, uh, they exactly follow the graphs of global GDP development. Because shipping is a derived demand. It's not like, you know, I want to go to the supermarket because I'm hungry. But because there are products to be moved, it's like a tool. I want to put a hammer in a wooden plank. I want to put a nail in a wooden plank, I use a hammer. Like that. I want to move goods around, I use ships. Uh, shipping industry is the most cost-effective way of transporting goods because of the economies of scale. The more you transport for the bigger distance, and if you divided the cost of the whole sh ship transportation per unit of cargo transported, it gives you the cheapest, cheapest rate. We're actually going to see it at the very end, how cheap it is. Uh, shipping industry also adds value because it provides a lot of jobs, gives a lot of salaries to people, and we're going to see on the example of the European Union, what happens. European Union today controls about 40% of global fleet. 60% uh, container ships, 52% multi-purpose, 43% oil tankers and LNG carriers. 70% of European Union imports rely on shipping. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of shipping industry to the European Union, and this is very interesting because uh, then we're going to see the Indian example, but not with ships, with, with other logistics types. And you're going to see how, like, how crazy the numbers are in India, in a good way. Uh, so, uh, activity within the shipping industry, uh, this is direct impact. So, just people involved in shipping, ashore or at sea, the split is 83 to 17%. Uh, altogether, direct impact of shipping industry is 40 or 54 billion uh, euros generated every year. This is statistic for 2019. And in some countries, like Greece or Cyprus, shipping sector plays a very detrimental role to the economy. In Cyprus, 7% of the country's GDP depend on shipping. In Greece, it's 4 Also, very interesting fact uh, about the seafarers. 38% uh, of sailors which work on European vessels are the nationals of Europe. The other 62, the bigger part, are not from Europe. So this is another opportunity. If you are a young man from India, you want to become a seafarer, European Union and we, <laughs> as Premium Consulting, can provide you with a certain, give you access to network, to certain training programs. Because it's going to be quite interesting, at the end of this slide, I'm going to see how much seafarers make on average per year. Very attractive numbers. 
Okay, so indirect impact is whoever is employed in shipping related services. We're talking logistics, supply chain management. Uh, it's about 78 uh, million, uh, 70, uh, 780,000 people, 57 billion. You can see how much inland logistics and supply chain management generate even, uh, you know, quite, quite crazy amounts of money for Europe. Uh, there's also induced impact, uh, which means that I don't know, like you, you work your job, let's say you get your salary, and then you're gonna go buy, you're gonna go to the supermarket and buy some food, or you're gonna go to the cinema and watch a movie. And this is called induced impact, is your consumer spending. So how this money are pumped back into the economy. And there's another 38 billion, so all the money that seafarers in Europe make, or people working in the shipping industry, they actually buy products for this much amount per year. Uh, okay, so this is the total impact, it's about 1% of the EU active words which works in shipping, 0.8% uh, of EU total GDP. And this is a very important fact, is the gross domestic product per worker. 74,000 euros per year. This is 81% higher, almost double, than the EU average GDP per capita in terms of purchasing power parity. This is a very, very good job to do. It's very skillful, it pays well, and you pretty much can sort out your future. Added value, this is very important because added value is something untangible. Uh, for every single job generated by shipping industry, a further 1.9 jobs are supported elsewhere. It means that one person working on the ship generates another two jobs, almost two jobs ashore in certain related services. For one euro generated directly by shipping industry, a further 1.76 euro is supported elsewhere in the European economy. So just by having the shipping industry in Europe, we increase our GDP. And that can be a very interesting opportunity for India to do, to adopt this European practice, because obviously Europe has perfected it over years. We also had a bad logistical problems in the past, but now they're over, and we can now share our experience with Indian colleagues. This is a very interesting aspect, ship management. I come from Cyprus. Cyprus is the biggest global center of ship management on par with Singapore. What is ship management? It's like asset management. Say, I don't know, like you're a bank and you had a, your lender defaulted on your loan. So you repossess the vessel, the ship, and you don't know what to do with it, but you want to make money. So you give it to the company in Cyprus or in Singapore and they manage it for you for a certain management fee. You keep all the profit and you forget about everything else. They take care of technical issues, crewing, training, operations and commercial management. So they pretty much run the business for you for a little fee. Uh, ship management uh, offers very competitive prices because they manage on average, in Cyprus we have big companies like Columbia or Marlow Navigation which have more than 300 vessels each. So because of that they can get very good prices, again economies of scale, on uh, different uh, materials, they have very good access to crewing pools all over the world, they have employment agencies and crewing centers, and if you want to work on the vessel, uh, going to a crewing center of ship management company is probably your best option. And again, we have a very good connection with the companies in Cyprus uh, that can provide Indian seafarers with international certification training and guarantee them a high, well-paid job on the European flag vessel. Uh, ship management companies are, uh, again, value-adding partners uh, and uh, they can cut costs to ship owners and benefit the industry and also contribute a lot to certain economies like in Cyprus. So Cyprus is one of the key ship management centers. We have a cluster. A cluster means that there's a variety of different services related to shipping because if you have a ship management company, immediately around it you have ship insurance, oh sorry, it's very you have shipping insurance, you have uh, training centers, you have financial institutions, you have ship management companies themselves, legal framework, like Mr. Petrus, uh, tax regime, because Cyprus, if you have a ship under the Cyprus flag, you don't pay a corporate tax. It's called gross tonnage tax. Gross tonnage is a measure of volume of the structure of the vessel. And depending on that, you have a coefficient on which you multiply that, and that's it, that's your fixed tax, you can make as much money as you want, you're not going to pay to the government, you already covered it. So this is a very, very beneficial thing, and this is why Cyprus controls one of the biggest merchant fleets in the world. And obviously Cyprus can act as a gateway to the European Union banking system, to the European Union trade, 
Because once you're in Cyprus and setting up your company there is fairly easy, you can have access to all the European services with a flick of your fingers. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about European practices, so uh, what they do to shipping, because it's such an integral industry. First of all, they want to reduce pollution. Uh, that involves uh, cutting CO2 by 2050. Uh, the, the vessels may, may go completely carbon free. We'll see how that will materialize. Uh, with uh, sulfurs, um, they already introduced the scrubbers, which are certain filters which you put on the engine of the vessel, so it doesn't emit sulfur in the atmosphere, creating sulfuric acid in the air. And obviously that touches upon environmentally uh, sound recycling of ships. So after the useful life cycle of the ship has ended, they send them for scrap. Actually one of the biggest uh, ship scrap yards in the world is located very close to India, in Bangladesh. And then this scrap steel is bought by many countries, actually mainly China, because they need a lot of scrap. I'm not sure about now with coronavirus, but that was the case recently. So also Europe wants to protect, uh, sorry, Europe wants to uh, protect the shipping industry, but also battle protection. Protection means that there is no open competition. They want to encourage competition. They want to protect the seafarers. They want to allow them freedom of movement of seafarers within the EU. They want to work very closely with WTO, the World Trade Organization, and advocate for a clear mandate for EU delegations to other countries. So this is also very important. Uh, we know that India and European Union have a very close relationship and we can work together when it comes to shipping and logistics. The usage of inland waterways and short sea transportation. This is very critical when we come to the Indian case because 32% of all goods within Europe, they move on short sea. Short sea means that you do cabotage. You go along the coast, say from Amsterdam to Bilbao, uh, not a long journey, but still it is cheaper per unit than taking it by truck or train and very, very cost effective. Also, inland waterway is a big thing in Europe because in Europe we have crazy road and rail line congestion. And uh, by using rivers, canals, moving a lot of cargoes that had previously moved, had previously been moved by uh, other modes onto ships. So we can alleviate the transportation chain, we can reduce atmospheric emissions from trucks, uh, and we can also encourage the cheaper cost per unit and add value to the final buyer. Uh, another big thing, digitization of everything. Uh, because, you know, if you want to play in today's economy, you have to be digitized, you have to know how to use computers, your systems have to be integrated with an artificial intelligence techniques, uh, and so on. So at the moment, European Union is introducing a lot of systems to reduce port formalities, because actually, believe it or not, one of the longest parts uh, on, on the vessel, uh, when the vessel, one of the longest uh, part of the time that the vessel spent in the port is actually sacrificed to going through all this documentation, bills of lading and checking it. So they want to digitize it, so before the ship arrives, all the documents are in order. And uh, again, providing uh, sustainable trainings to seafarers of any nationality within the European framework. And increasing safety. Now we're going to come and talk about Indian logistics chain and uh, what can be done to improve it and to actually make India a very, very competitive country on the global export and import game. Uh, here we have a graph on what it's like to have a percentage of logistics costs. So here we have, uh, sorry, uh, here we have logistics element as percentage of delivered good cost. Uh, India is actually not that bad, it's 44th in the world out of almost 200 countries. Uh, but here we compare it with some, uh, some of the, you know, big countries uh, in terms of GDP and uh, trade so far, let's say Big Mama China, uh, which despite being a very sparse country, have integrated and perfected their logistics chain, now it's at 10%. In America it's 9, in Europe it's around 8, Germany leading the way, and Singapore is a tiny country, not too many places to go, it's 7%. So India at the moment, according to Drew Report, has 15% as a logistics cost. It means that if you go to the shop and you buy like a bottle of water or this leather shoes, 15% of that has been spent on moving this good to you, which is fairly high if you guys want to be competitive in the future. But that can be fixed, and it's already been fixed by the steps Mr. Modi's government is taking. But also private sector is very important player. So this is an EG of how logistics system uh, has been in India for many years, 
and uh, what it's like in the moment. Uh, it's basically a mismatch of ports and hinterlands. Uh, Indian's biggest exporting port is Mumbai. It has a few container terminals, including the biggest one in India. Uh, and uh, here we take an example of pharmaceutical cluster, which is in the south of the country. Chennai, the Garuru, and Mishore. I hope I pronounced those correctly. Uh, at the moment, the goods, the pharmaceuticals, the pills, they're being moved in containers to Mumbai by roads, by trucks. And this is not very cost efficient, because in Europe, for example, what they would have done, they would have bring it by truck to Chennai and then take it on the ship to Mumbai. It would have been a little bit longer, but way cheaper and much more reliable, because you don't know what's going to happen on the road. The roads are very congested. The port approaches may create bottleneck effects. There's a lot of issues with that. So uh, optimizing logistics chain, moving to more cost-efficient transport is the key. So at the moment here you see the breakdown of Indian transportation modes. So 65% of cargo within India is transported by trucks, 25 by train, and only 10 by other modes, including short sea shipping, inland waterways, and planes. In Europe, you have 32 by ships, uh, then about 25% by trains, the same amount by trucks, and the rest by planes. Completely different breakdown. Uh, what are the challenges that you know the road transportation creates? Uh, the thing is that the, the, these companies, these trucksters, they're actually managed by very small companies. They have one, two vehicles at their disposal. They can't offer competitive prices. They can't offer economies of scale. They can't offer digitization of logistics, which is also a very important factor. Uh, there's a very uh, big indirect costs, or so-called inventory carrying costs, occurring from long lead time, negligence, mm -hmm. poor lashing, pilferage, and damage to the cargo. And that unfortunately creates 80 billion value loss. What I mean value loss, it's not direct financial loss, it's the cost of lost sales. This cargo, if it had been you know, in the port earlier, if it had been transported uh, cheaper, it could have been sold elsewhere and uh, basically all those goods which had not been sold uh, would have generated the value of 80 billion euro every year. And obviously the road congestion is the key here. So this is what the government of India is trying to do and already doing. Uh, this is uh, Sagarmala uh, Port-led Prosperity Project. which is